All right. I want to thank everyone for joining us. My name is Rabbi Morgan Bookbinder. And uh, this is the fourth installment in our Munch, Mingle, and Mew Munch and Learn series. And we've had uh, great turnouts, we've had interesting speakers, great presentations. And now, so far, we're at the next pinnacle, right? Everyone's all pumped up for what has been a great series thus far. Uh, today's presentation is about Ashkenazim and Sephardim. I think something that all of us can relate on one level or other. And we have a number of guests who joined us today. I want to thank everyone and welcome all of our guests who joined us from Rabbi Zule's congregation. Uh, I also want to give a very special thank you to our series sponsors, David and Shimon Petrov, thank you so much. David Rompton, thank you so much for being a generous support for the program. Anybody else who wishes to help step forward and also you know, help the, the series take place, please feel free to speak to me. And without further ado, I would like to turn today's program over to our speakers who will introduce themselves. Okay, Rabbi Azula, I take it away. So uh, we wanted to start this program by asking you to figure out who the Sephardi is and not who the Ashkenazi is, because <laughs> I'm wearing the Ashkenaz hat, and he's the uh, Sephardic without the Ashkenaz hat, so I'll, uh, I'll be Sephardic now. Let's put this here. So thank you uh, so much, Rabbi Eli, uh, friend and colleague. And it's not the only time we sit together uh, like this, as we sit on the um, Toronto Bet Din for conversions. I cracked the joke earlier that often when we sit like this, the people opposite us is in the conversion process. So I don't know if that's the case here. But, but uh, <laughs> so um, thank you again for inviting me, and, and thanks for the warm welcome. And shout out to the guys from Again David. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Masoud Azulai, uh, born and raised here in Toronto. Uh, my parents are from Morocco. They were born there. I went to Or Hamet, a proud graduate of Or Hamet Sephardic School, proud graduate of Near Israel Yeshiva. I then uh, studied in Israel for about nine years, three years single, six years married in Kolel. Uh, my wife's from Los Angeles, a Sephardic girl, Egyptian origin. And then we moved back here almost 10 years ago. I was the assistant rabbi at the Sephardic Kila Center for three years, and now the rabbi at Magen David Congregation for almost seven years. Thank God. Um, All right, so... Uh, just in case some of my guys don't know you. <laughs> so I am Ellie Carfunkel, and uh, I went to uh, RJJ for elementary school, rabbinical jails for Jews, as though we called it. Uh, then I went to... Uh, Manhattan Torah Academy. I did a gap year in Israel. I came back to uh, New York uh, to study for smicha. I met uh, the Rebbets and Rifke, a Toronto girl. I thought gravity would bring her down, but Jewish women defy gravity. And uh, after I got smicha, uh, I went out to the great city of Oshawa, Ontario, of course. Uh, they didn't have a weekday minion, so I used to travel in every day. And then I met some people in Forest Hill, and we started a shul from scratch. And here we are, you know, 25 years later. So a big blessing. Wow. And, uh, you know, we're about to talk about the history of Ashkenaz and Sfard. I'm very uh, classic, I guess. I grew up where in my elementary school, I had 28 classmates. Uh, 27 uh, were grandchildren of survivors. So I grew up really uh, amazingly, even though I grew up in the 80s, with not a lot of connection to anyone that uh, wasn't from Poland or Russia or Hungary. And uh, I guess one of the blessings I had is moving to Toronto, which is uh, obviously, a lot, I think, a lot more multicultural de definitely than my neighborhood in Staten Island, and I got to be connected to so many different types of Jews. So there you go. All right, amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, so like in Orhamet, obviously, it was a Sephardic school. We did have one token Ashkenazi in my, in my eighth grade class. And in Nair Israel, it was predominantly Ashkenazi. Um, but there were a few Sephardic boys there. And uh, just su such fond uh, connection. Thank God my, my son is in Nair Israel now. I know the rabbi's son's there and graduate. Um, our son is in the same class as well, since uh, infancy as well, uh, Ezra and my son Yosef. 
Um, but yeah, let's get into, I guess, uh, the history. Before so we far. start, I just want to say that Rabbi Azulai is good friends with Steph Curry. So, uh, the famous basketball player. I just want to say that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now that we got that out of the way. As you know, Rabbi Eli's a big sports guy, and uh, I, sorry. not him, had the fortunate uh, mazel to, mit, ah. uh, to meet Steph Curry. So, yeah. All right, take it away. Okay, so uh, a little bit about Sephardic history. Let's go through some uh, Jewish history and uh, kind of bring it till today. Um, it all started with Adam and Eve. All right, so, we can, so Adam, Noah, the Avot. We were in Mitzrayim for 210 years. We left Mitzrayim. We received the Torah. We were in the desert for 40 years. We enter Israel with Yoshua Binun. We were there for about 400 years until the first Bet Hamidash was built. First Bet Hamidash was was uh, stood for 410 years, and then unfortunately Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroyed the first Bet Hamidash. There's a 70-year gap. That's when the story of Purim happened until the construction of the second Bet HaMittash. It is said that when Nebuchadnezzar dispersed the 10 tribes, that's where Jews already didn't come back to Israel for the second Bet HaMittash. Only, I think, one third came back to Israel by the second Bet HaMittash, and there were Jews living in the diaspora. And there's a tradition that there were Jews in Morocco, so I'm going to be talking heavily about Morocco because that's my heritage, um, there were Jews in Morocco already from after the destruction of the first Bet HaMidash. I think Jews in North Africa, Tunisia, Libya, etc. have that tradition. Certainly in Iraq and Iran, because that's where the Galut, that's where the exile went to, there were still Jews remaining there, even though the Bet- second Bet HaMidash uh, was going to be rebuilt. Second Bet HaMidash was built. It stood for 420 years, destroyed by the Romans, and there certainly people dispersed. But the hub of Jewry was in Iraq. The Talmud Bavli, the Gemara, was written in Iraq. There was, of course, one in Jerusalem as well. But the hub of, of Judaism, of Torah Judaism, was there. The Tanaim, the Amoraim, the Geonim, bringing us back to about year 1000, current, uh, current era, where the hub of Judaism was in, in Iraq. So the question is, how did that hub of Torah, all the, all the writings were, were based from Iraq, the Geonim, how did that transfer to Spain? Because there were Jews in Morocco, as mentioned, and I guess crept up to Spain. How did that happen that the golden era of our Rishonim, the Rambam, the Rif, and even we're going to hear about the Ashkenazi, Rabbeinu Gershom and Rashi, which were in France and Germany, how did that how did that shift happen? So here's where there's this, the story, the famous story of the four captives. The story uh, is brought down, I'm sure, in many places. One of the places is, is a, a sefer called Sefer HaKabbalah of the Ra'avad, one of the Rishonim, who mentions the story as follows. There were four Geonim living in Iraq that went out on a mission, on a boat, to collect money. Iraq, I guess they got to the harbor, maybe in Haifa, to go and collect money for poor Jewish girls that needed to get married. And back in the day, you know, now if someone comes to collect money, they're usually an emissary of whatever they're collecting for. And you could easily Google their organization, etc. So they could send out anyone, really. Back in the day, they needed to send out the wise, the chachamim, the tzaddikim, in order to really show and prove themselves, because there's no other method of proving who they were. So four geonim were on this boat, Rabbi Shemaria ben Elchanan, Rabbi Chushiel, and his son, Rabbi Nuchananel. If you heard of that name, he's uh, often printed on the side of the Gemara. Rabbi Moshe with his son and wife, Rabbi Nuchanoch. Rabbi Nuchanoch was the author of the Sefer HaAruch, one of the first early Aramaic dictionaries. And the fourth recorded in the Sefer is, he doesn't know his name, but there was a fourth Gaon. And they were captured by pirates. And the pirates, they wanted to ransom these four rabbis and get and get money. So Rabbi Shemariah was ransomed to the Jewish community in Alexandria. Rabbi Chushiel and his son Rabbi Nuchananel were ransomed by the community in Tunisia, in a city called Karwan, which eventually became a very big yeshiva, which the Rif, Rabbi Yitzchak El Fasi, one of the three pillars and backbones for the Shulchan Aruch, studied there. Rabbeinu Moshe 
was he was he was ransomed by the community in Cordoba, as it seems like these pirates were originally from Cordoba, you know, traversing the Mediterranean. And the fourth one, it seems like he ended in uh, ended up in Sicily. So at that point, the Jewish community in Spain and I think worldwide, they knew Iraq was the address for any difficult situations, halachic, etc. Jewish situations, the address was always the Geonim in Iraq. And they would send emissaries there for big questions. But Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Moshe, and his son, Rav Chanoch, were in North Africa, were in Cordoba. And now you have Rabbi Chananel and his father in Tunisia. There, they now started, they didn't, they didn't need to go far to get their answers answered, and they could start building on their own. And that's what happened. And there, he records a story of Rabbi Moshe being a very pious man. I'm taking a little bit too much time, sorry. But he's, he's, he's a really pious man, and he, he's in a shul, and the rabbi of the shul's name is Rabbi Natan. And Rabbi Natan is giving a shiur on a Mishnah in Masechet Yuma. Very difficult Mishnayo with regards to the service of the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. And he's having trouble discussing the Kmitzah, how to give the flower offering. And with this difficulty, it seems like Rabbeinu Moshe raises his hand. He's like, can I explain maybe? And he gives an explanation where Rabbeinu Natan realized this rabbi is something special. <laughs> this Babylonian person that they got and they paid for rent and something special. The story goes that he took off his coat and he gave him the coat. He says, now you're the rabbi of the community. And that it's, it might be difficult for us. To, <laughs> someone stumps us in a shiur to do that, right? It's something that's um, very brave and, and really going for the, the uh, looking out for the community. And this Rabbeinu Moshe led the community. And that's how Spain flourished. That started the golden era from year around 1000 until 1492, the Spanish Inquisition. Already a little bit before that, things were troublesome. But during that period, it was a time where the Jews flourished. The great rabbis, all the Rishonim, for the most part, were there. They were able to study and write the Rambam, the Ramban, the Rivash, uh, the Rashba, the, the Rosh came from Germany because of persecutions to Spain. We'll talk about that a little bit later, connection to Morocco. But you had the Rif, the Rambam, and the Rosh, which was the, the backbone of the Shulchan Aruch. They were all there. That was the golden era. Unfortunately, until 1492, the Spanish Inquisition. We won't get into the whole story of the Spanish Inquisition, but the Jews left Spain and from there went to Morocco. There's communities in, 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 in Amsterdam, communities in the Balkans, Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, North Africa. And the Jews that, the Sephardic Jews in, let's say, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Azerbaijan, uh, Bukharian, those are remnants of the Jews that will always stayed in Iraq. And that's why you might hear there's Sephardim and there's Edot HaMizrach. The, 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 the eastern region, that is Edot HaMizrach, so that's Iraq, Iran, etc. And Sephardim will usually be Morocco, Spain, and the Balkans. So at that point, it seems like Jewish history was more individualized in the Sephardic lands. It's Moroccan Jewish history, Tunisian Jewish history, Libyan, uh, Lebanon, etc. And then we all kind of came together, unfortunately, um, at the Holocaust. Um, six million of our, our brothers and sisters, predominantly, of course, Ashkenazim, perished, as you know. Um, 100,000, 100, actually, of the six million were Sephardim, uh, mainly from Greece, as their Basically, entire community um, was killed by the Nazis. About 80,000 of that 100,000 were from Greece, and the other 20,000 were from, from Bulgaria, a little bit in Tunisia, as Tunisia was the only country that, that Hitler, Yimach Shemot, reached uh, on, on North Africa. And um, we have someone in our community, you might recognize the name, Mr. Maurice Benzakar, uh, who worked in the Jais for many, many years and helped a lot of people immigrate to Canada. He's, as Rath Hashem, turning 90 today, actually, I didn't call him yet. Today is his 90th birthday. And his father-in-law, a Sephardic Jew originally from Portugal, passed away in Auschwitz. The story there goes that he was a wealthy man. It seems like the wealthy men that were able to leave Sephardic land and, and go on business in Europe, and at the time of the war, they got caught there and they got killed there as well. 
So he had a very Jewish name, Chaim Cohen. He traveled with a fellow Moroccan. He went from Portugal to Morocco, a fellow Moroccan Jew with a very Moroccan last name, maybe Azulai, maybe Azerwal, maybe uh, Amzalag, a very maybe Arabic kind of last name. And they were, they were on business and they got caught in Europe. And the family back at home didn't know where their father, Chaim Cohen, was for all these years until one daughter was one sitting in a, in a Casablanca doctor's office and they called her name Sarah Cohen. And this man, Mr. Amzalak, who was with Chaim Cohen, he says, are you the daughter of Chaim Cohen? She says, yes, of course, I'm looking for my father. We don't know where he is, it's been years. He says, I was captured with your father in Europe and I said, I'm not Jewish. I said that I'm Muslim and they let me go. But with a name like Chaim Cohen, he was, he was, he was stuck and most, for the most part he was killed and they eventually found out that he was killed so therefore, it did affect, on a very small scale, it did affect Sfaradim. After the Holocaust was, of course, uh, the state of Israel, which caused a lot of anti-Semitism in Sephardic lands. And a lot of the Sfaradim in those lands left those lands. Yes, there's about 3,500 um, Moroccan Jews left in Morocco to today. It doesn't compare to the 500,000 or so that was there uh, you know, pre-state of Israel, so to all the Sephardic lands, where now you have Sephardim going to countries that they've never gone to before, uh, Canada, America, uh, Venezuela, France, so you have North America, South America, um, Northern Europe, or, sorry, Europe, and, uh, you know, different places where they weren't until until uh, that point. Um, the Jews in those countries did, it, it was brought even to the UN, um, they did suffer um, anti-Semitism, their land was taken over in those countries, Morocco, Iraq. Uh, I think there was, a, there was a thing in Iraq called Nekba, where they, they, they killed, it was a pogroms. This was all after the state of Israel, where the, the Arabs in those countries were, you know, they, they said, you Jews, look where you guys, you guys took our land in Palestine, and they took retribution against those Jews. Um, Jews died, their, 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 their belongings were pillaged. I know my in-laws from Egypt had to escape without was leaving their land and money and everything behind eventually to France because it was a French colony and then eventually to Los Angeles. So there was a little bit of suffering there um, by the Jews, by, by the non-Jews, the Arabs in those Arab uh, lands. I think that's uh, okay, a wow. little bit of a nugget a great, of, uh, uh, of, I guess, Spartac history okay. in a nutshell. So I just, uh, um, just a little flavor uh, also about the history of Ashkenazic Jewry. When the Romans uh, marched forward and took over Europe, um, the Jews came with them. So the Romans eventually turns Christian, and uh, and eventually the Christ the Roman Empire left uh, the Gauls. They left France, uh, but the Jews remained. Uh, I guess some Roman soldiers remained. So we're talking about Ashkenazic Jewry. We're really talking about. Frenchmen, which is ironic because I think 90% of the Jews living in France now are probably yeah. uh, Sardi, but. Ashkenazic Jewry basically start around a little bit after, during the time of Charlemagne, the Jews are in France. There's basically three neighborhoods in France. Um, you have the area of Paris and Troyes, where Rashi's from. You have um, Provence, which you are familiar with, uh, places like Narbonne and, and Lunil. Um, and, um, and then you have a neighborhood called Shum. Shum is, actually means garlic, but it's an acronym for spires, which we call Shapiro, uh, Vermeis, which we called worms. And uh, and Margaiza, which we call mines, that's where the that's where Ashkenazic Jewry started. As we became successful, as we helped contribute, um, and we also had lots of turmoil, the Jews made their way to Central Europe and eventually to Eastern Europe. And so, uh, what started probably as 5,000 Jews uh, under Charlemagne in France became the Ashkenazic community. So, if you're wondering why. A lot of Ashkenazic people have certain diseases and stuff because there's a lot of intermarriage. I'd just like to highlight a couple of things about uh, living in the Christian world uh, because it's very different than living in the Muslim world. Essentially, you have two or three things to think about when you're talking about Ashkenazic Jewry. Uh, number one is um, the fact that the Christians were very, very from. They were very religious. Um, you did not want to go to H-E double hockey sticks uh, if you were a Christian. Um, and one of the major laws that uh, didn't really affect the world during the Dark Ages 
uh, were investments. No one, no one gave anyone money to invest in a startup. There was no crypto. There was very little going on. And so $1,000 in the year 1,000 was worth $1,000 in the year 1,010. Uh, but we know that money has value. And as the world after Charlemagne started picking up, uh, the Christians who relied very heavily on dogma, the earth is flat, uh, there's no way you can get around interest. Um, they rely heavily on these things. They were stuck. How was it going to be that they were able to invest and use their capital investments to create a new Europe? Well, here comes in the people that they relied on heavily uh, for interests, and that was the Jew. So the Jew is responsible. Now, we have we obviously believe also in not charging interest, um, but we have uh, creative solutions to create opportunities. Um, for another time, we'll discuss something called the Heter Iska, uh, which is not a loan, but an investment. Um, but we've recreated a system where you can have investments. So the non-Jewish Europe, the Christian Europe, the Europe that the Ashkenazic Jewry from 1,000 to 1,500 grew in was a community where the Jews were relied heavily upon for investments. Obviously, if the non-Jews couldn't pay back the investments after a while, it was not bad news for the Christians, it was bad news for the Jews. Um, but that's idea number one, is that we created the economy of Europe for those 500 years. Uh, number two, which I think is also very worthy to note, is that uh, we were the scapegoats. So uh, I think we still are. But essentially, if nothing's going well in your country, in your province, in your community, you can always blame the Jews. You can blame the Jews for poisoning the water. You can blame the Jews for going like this to the water. You can blame the Jews for everything. Um, did not take, um, I don't think this is unique to Christian Europe and the Ashkenazic world. But ultimately, the Jews are blamed for every problem that anyone encounters. And number three, I think it's important to also appreciate that Europe was basically, there are two types of people that were literate, basically priests and Jews. So a, a kid in pre-1A knew how to read Hebrew, probably knew how to read uh, Old French, and no one else did. Uh, no one else was literate except for some priests and the entire Jewish community. So uh, this created a couple of things as well. This created um, a opportunity for the Jews to be on the cutting edge of every idea because no one was thinking of ideas. If there was some book written, you know, who was reading it? There were the Jewish people reading it and taking in ideas and growing ideas. So a lot of that was created. Uh, all the, whatever was created in the year 1000 to 1500 was very much Jew-related because the Jews were the scholars of Europe, the Jews were the merchants of Europe, and um, the Jews, of course, were the scapegoats of Europe. So basically, if you were a Jew in Europe, in Europe during the 500 years, you had to be successful, but not too successful. Sort of like how you deal with your brother-in-law nowadays. Uh, you want to be successful, but not too successful, so your brother-in-law will hate your gut. So um, that's sort of how the Jews lived in Europe. One of the things that was very, very uh, real, real for us, and I don't know how this impacted the Sephardic world, is that you do not have a high assimilation rate during the 500 years from 1,000 to 1,500. Because the Jew looked at as non-Jewish, illiterate, uh, you know, uh, someone that was uh, uh, very into, um, you know, uh, voodoo, witchcraft, whatever, whatever thing they were into, they were not into uh, what we were into. So it was not a great desire to become them. Of course, after you have the Enlightenment and you have uh, a, a reawakening of Christian Europe, uh, you have great opportunities for Jews, and with great opportunities comes the great challenges of mingling with people that you see as your peers, and of course leading to assimilation. So that's sort of Ashkenazic Jewry in a nutshell. Merci. Okay, let's, if we can, I'll just focus a little bit now. That's sort of the and we're going to have time for questions. That's sort of the framework, and we can just do a little bit of, you know, halakha, and then just get real and talk about my thoughts about the Sephardic and Ashkenazi community, um, and Rabbi Zul will share his thoughts. But just a little bit about Torah in the Sephardic world, and I'll do a very small bit of uh, Torah in the Ashkenazi world, and then we'll take a deep dive into our personal lives. Okay, so just before I get into halakha, if I could just add one piece with regards to Jews living in, in, Arab, in Arabic lands. So from what I understand, <clears throat> the Muslims, 
which, you know, uh, the Quran, I think it's about 1,600 years old or 1,300 years old, they knew that we came, we preceded them. So we as Jews were called in their eyes a dhimmi. A dhimmi is like a second class citizen. So we had rights, but you're second class. So there was, it seems like there was some sort of respect that let us do our thing. And that's why for the most part, things were okay in the, uh, in the Sephardic lands under them. It was in 1492 where Spain became less of an Arab country and more of a Christian country, Ferdinand, etc., that that's when things went south for the Jews um, due to the Christians. And of course, we can only imagine how the Jews in Europe uh, suffered with the, in, the, in the hands of the Christians. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit more freedom of religion um, uh, uh, under, the, under the Arabs. Um, as far as assimilation, as far as I know, I don't think it was... Uh, you know, even, there were, there's two different... Uh, unfortunately, as you mentioned, it was only in recent times where I think assimilation was a thing, a, a, a Jewish you know, issue in, in all of Jews. Um, okay, so a few halakhic differences you might know some of these, uh, just to kind of bring them out. So, Sfaradim, we wear a tali, in no particular rhyme, or reason, or order. Um, and some, some interesting things with regards to Moroccan jewelry. So, we Sfaradim, we wear a tali already at bar mitzvah, not at wedding. That's when you guys get married. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's our parents wanted us to get married. Yeah, back in the day, it was like, I'm married young, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how it was, and it's like my, my grandmother got engaged at 14. But I have parent people Let's that, so yeah, and, and married at 19. She was like a rebel. Like mm-hmm. girls were getting married young, guys were getting married young. Uh, I'm not sure how it was in the Ashkenazi world, but back in the day they got married really, really young. Um, we don't have a yichud room at, at the uh, at after the wedding. It's uh, just straight into the into the party. And now we've Ashkenized a little bit because as a modernist, you know. I think because we're all dispersed from all of our lands, Ashkenazim from the European lands, Sephardim from our Sephardic lands, and Baruch Hashem, we're, we're, we're coming together. Hopefully, I'll end with this at the end of the the the, 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 the event uh, with some psukim that refer to this. Baruch Hashem, when Mashiach comes, we're all we're all of course one nation. We're all we're all brothers. So there's a lot of influence. We're all in that you know yeshiva or kind of that melting pot where we're all together. This thing you know. My father told me, my father's not that, that old, he said the first time he saw an Ashkenazi, he grew up in, in, in Morocco, was when he went to Israel um, as a 14-year-old in a kibbutz, and he sees a Romanian Jew with blonde hair. He says, this guy's not Jewish. How could it be? This guy's Jewish, right? So the first time he ever saw an Ashkenazi. So these are things that, Baruch Hashem, we grow up, our kids are, yes, Faradim, Ashkenazi, my class, it's, it's you know, regular, but this was things that, that didn't really exist back then. Um, we eat kitniyot on Pesach. We don't have the whole kabrach thing. We don't, we don't have that. But we do do selichot for 40 days uh, in Elul. So that's a little bit of a balance there. Um, yeah. So, uh, Sephardic? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. All right. Um, so, so Moroccans have a custom to wear tefillin at mincha on fast days in order to get more brachot, talit and tefillin. Uh, because you're, you're you're supposed to get 100 brachot every day, so we have less. The Bet Yosef already brings down the custom. Other Sephardim don't do it. Um, the difference between the Sephardic and Ashkenazi is ketubah. Ashkenazim hold that a ketubah, because there's a, there's a whole discussion in the Gemara, is a ketubah midoraita or midirabanan. The Ashkenazi poskim hold it midoraita. Sephardim hold it midirabanan. And in the Ashkenaz ketubahs, there's no last names, and the, the amount of money is the... Gemara amount, 200 Zuz. Sephardim have last names, and we have um, 200 Zuz, but we also bring it into um, present-day money values. Issues with that is if, if currencies go extinct after the 50 years of marriage, or go way up or way high, way lower in value. Also, you could get to issues, it's been on the news a few years ago, where unfortunately at the wedding, the guy says, I'm going to write you a million dollars in my ketubah. And she's like, only a million? And then they get into a fight or something like that, right? So, you know, part of these Sephardic good value things is we're very emotional. Sometimes that can be <laughs> to our detriment, but we'll, we'll get there a little bit later. Um, we don't have the Tanaim at the wedding. Um, we name after the living, after the living predominantly. And for Ashkenazim, that's like so bad for Sephardim, the ones that do it. If I wouldn't have named my son after my father, I think I would have been dead. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's so important. Um, for, for the ones that do. There are some Sephardim that don't. I think for the most part, they do. Um, we wear a Tulin Shiliyad. We said the bracha sitting down. We're standing up. 
Um, certain letters in the Torah are written a little bit different. The shin, Ashkenazim have a point at the shin. Sephardim have kind of flat. Uh, the chet is two zions with a little hook attached for Ashkenazim. For Sephardim, it's like a flat bar on top. Um, of course, the pronunciation, the ta and the sa. Um, certain, of course, tefillot are different. For the most part, there's, there's the same. Um, you got the stand-up Torah versus the lying down Torah, or the stand-up mezuzah versus the slanted mezuzah. Moroccans have a lot of things similar to Ashkenazim, and this is, as I, I mentioned, the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, started in Germany, due to pogroms, he went to Spain, and there, there was something similar to the story I told you of Rav Natan, the Rashba, one of the great Rishonim, was the head of the Sephardic Jewry in Spain, and he saw the Rosh, how great he was, and he said, not at the moment, but after I pass away, I want you to take over. And the Rosh took over after the Rashba. So he brought a lot of Ashkenazic influences, but he took over the Spain. So some of those Ashkenazic influences trickle down to Morocco. As after 1492, Jews spread everywhere, and Jews came from Spain to Morocco. But if you remember, there were Jews in Morocco already after the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. There was a little bit of a conflict. Those original Jews were called the Toshavim, the ones that were Toshav, they were living there. The ones that came from Spain were the Megorashim, the ones that were sent out. And when they both came, there was a little bit of a clash. They at first prayed in different shuls, and the Toshavim, the ones that were there, would pray with no shoes on, kind of like the Muslims. Where these ones came from Europe, Spain, they wore shoes, and they had different dress. They didn't trust each other's shechita, but then it got to a point where they all kind of melted uh, into one. But you have, till today, more... I guess, the mountain Jews in, in, in Morocco where probably date back to the original Toshavim. And you have maybe the ones that were in the bigger cities, etc. And for myself, my parents are from the, are from the north, which is the Spanish zone. So we're for sure from the Megorashim. Whereas the French zone, I got I to gotta be tread, treading my words because I'm the rabbi of the French school. So uh, um, they, they are a mix. Some of them came from Spain or some of them are from the original uh, Toshavim. So, yeah, so some similarities is that Moroccans don't eat rice on Pesach, whereas all other Sephardim do. So that's like Ashkenazim. Um, In general, I I mentioned the stand-up Torah. Even Moroccans in our shul as well, we have the stand-up Torahs, just because maybe it's really nice. But original Moroccan Sifre Torah were like Ashkenazi Sifre Torah, as opposed to Iraqi, etc., that do have the stand-up only. Um, Bet Yosef meat. You might have heard that the Bet Yosef's opinion is... When, in short, when you have, you have to check the lungs that it's a kosher, that's kosher, that it doesn't have any holes in its lungs. And if there's any mucus that's attached to the lung that you can't remove, the Bet Yosef says, well, it's plugging a hole and it's not kosher. Whereas the Ramah holds, well, there's no hole because the mucus is plugging it, but maybe there's just no hole there. And the Ramah is more lenient. The Moroccans take that opinion as well. There's other Sfaradim that are stringent to get Bet Yosef meat. That's in short what it's all about. Um, Friday night candles. Moroccans light like Ashkenazim, where we light the candles first, then the ladies cover their eyes and, and, and open up. Whereas other Sfaradim, just like before any bracha, they say the bracha, then they light. Just like before you take a bite of an apple, you say the bracha, then you, then you bite into it. So Moroccans do like the Ashkenazim as opposed to the other Sfaradim. Also eating fish and milk together, that bagel, lox, and cream cheese sandwich, uh, Ashkenazim eat milk and, uh, and, and fish together. Um, Moroccans do as well, um, and other Sephardim in general don't. So that's another little bit of a, little bit of a difference. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a lox guy, so uh, it doesn't, doesn't affect me. But I, I do, I loved tuna melts until I really realized that, you know, maybe, I don't know, even though Moroccan, I kind of took that stringency a little bit. But here's so much Kenazic uh, Okay, point. so I didn't uh, mention all of them. You know, I, th- I think you highlighted the. Uh, the, some of the, the unique things. I just want to highlight just basically the names of three rabbis, um, and it'll just take a couple of minutes to appreciate Ashkenazic Jewry. Ashkenazic Jewry basically started, the first big rabbi was a rabbi named Rabbi Gershom, Ma'ar HaGol, Rabbi Gershom, the, the light of the exile. He was around the year 1000. He was, uh, his students were the teachers of Rashi. So he basically created three laws. Number one is he outlawed polygamy. Polygamy is allowed according to the Torah, or Torah, um, and he outlawed it, which is interesting. He outlawed it primarily because it wasn't working. I mean, could that have ever worked? Um, 
and also because the Christians said this is uh, this is not you know, we're we're more moral than uh, than than the Jews. So he felt that any time that 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 it was like it looked bad upon us, he said we have to outlaw it. So he actually outlawed polygamy. That's the end of polygamy in the Ashkenazic world. Uh, number two is you know you can't get divorced. You can't. Uh, force a man to divorce his wife. And he felt you also can't divorce a woman against her will. So just like, uh, you know, it's good for the goose, good for the gander. So he created this law that you can't be divorced against your will, either you're male or, male or female. And the last thing, which you might think is a small thing, which is huge, this was considered so huge, um, and he was so respected that, um, I'll tell you, he made a law, you're not allowed to read other people's mail. So you imagine how mail went from one place to another place. You wrote a postcard. You remember in camp you wrote a postcard and you sent it on your way. And who read it? Your, your parents read it. I don't think the mailman's looking at your, your postcard from camp that you're crying and you want to go home, right? Uh, but letters traveled and all you had to do was write on the back of the envelope, Rabbein, like RG, Rabbeinu Gershon, or CRG, Cherem Rabbeinu Gershon, and you were almost secured that no one ever would have the audacity to read your letter. So because of these three things, he was called the light of the exile. Of course, his student student was Rashi. And just like if you'd have to put one rabbi's face on Ashkenazic Jewry, you would put Rashi. And I guess if you put one rabbi's face on Sephardic Jewry, you would say the, the Rambam, right? Not that any other rabbi, I mean, they all make my top 10, all the Ashkenazic rabbis, all the Sephardic rabbis. I think Rambam and Rashi, we would say are like top two, whatever, uh, <coughs> or top one in each. And so the house of Rashi, with his, with his famous daughters and his famous grandchildren, they sort of built Ashkenazic Jewry and thought. I mean, um, everyone reads Chumash. The first commentary is Chumash with Rashi. And then the last rabbi was probably the most important rabbi to, to, to do what Rabbi Azulai said, which is bring the communities together. Because every, you have a million rabbis have a million opinions. So there was one rabbi said, oh, I'm going to write one book. I'm going to call it the set table, and it's going to be for all of Jewry. And this was Rabbi Yosef Cairo. So what the Rambam was for Sephardic Jewry, Rabbi Yosef Cairo was sort of the culmination of Sephardic Jewry in the 1500s, and he wrote a book that every Jew could read and know what the law is, and he called that the Shulchan Aruch, except one problem. It was really only for Sephardic uh, Jews. Across the planet, many years later, uh, there was a rabbi in Krakow, uh, and he was Rabbi Moser Israelis, and he also wanted to write a book of getting all the Ashkenazic laws together. But he said, hold on a second. If this guy, if this rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Kara has a book, and I have a book, then they'll sit on the shelves, and then the Sephardic rabbi will have his book, the Ashkenazic will have his book. So he did, according to the many, the most humble act of a rabbi ever. He didn't publish his book. All he did was write glossaries to the opinion of Rabbi Yosef Cairo. So Rabbi Yosef Cairo wrote a book called the Shulchan Aruch, and there's like 100,000 things in there, and uh, give or take, I don't know. And Rabbi Moshe Israelis said, I, I disagree with, with you know, 1,500 of those 100,000, but not a major disagreement. Uh, a tweak here, a tweak there. So he actually wrote an addendum to the book, and he called his book, which he never even wrote, it was just an addendum, he called it the tablecloth. The Mapa. So you have the Shulchan Aruch written by Yosef Cairo, and you have the table called written by Rabbi Moshe Israelis. They're in the same book now. The book is called the Shulchan Aruch. And that, more than anything, allowed Sephardic and Ashok Jewry uh, to come together as uh, learning from one book, having one community. Before I hand the phone, before I hand the, uh, the mic back to uh, Rabbi Azula, I just want to say three things that I look at the Sephardic community and I wish the Ashkenazi community would do more of. Now, obviously, we basically all assimilated. I think that 100 years ago, if an Ashkenazi married a Sephardi or vice versa, all four parents would be like, woe is me. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, right? I think that has changed. Obviously, there's a lot of different cultures. I think marriage is hard enough, and you want to marry people similar to you. Um, so, you know, I think if you're a mega millionaire, you should probably marry a mega millionaire, you know, and if you're, uh, if you're blue collar, maybe it's easier to marry someone blue collar. I, I, it just seems that it's easier to marry uh, people like you. So, uh, um, there are differences, but the only difference is if you consider them a difference 
And if they don't consider them a difference, then they're not a difference. So let me just tell you the three things that I wish my community, the Ashkenazi community in general, would be more like the Sephardic community. Um, number one is, uh, which um, is not level of importance, uh, they actually pray every word. Um, you go to an Ashkenazic uh, shul and close your eyes. It's basically the drill of a dentist noise. Uh, everyone's just, you know, reading at 150 kilometers per hour, and uh, and if you win, if you finish first, you win, right? So Hashem's like, you won. Okay. Um, so that's how Ashkenaz. Now it's an advantage if you have to go to work. Tuesday morning. You go to a Sephardic, no one works in the Sephardic community. <laughs> they pray, I don't know, their wives are waiting for them, the kids are waiting, they pray, and when you think it's over, they're just at midfield, right? It's not over. No, 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 we have to say one more Kaddish, uh, and that Kaddish lasts 20 minutes, and then no, it's not over yet, it's not over yet, it's not over yet. One second, it's almost time for afternoon prayer, we don't even have to leave the synagogue. So, uh, I'm always jealous because they're davening every word, slowly enunciating it. I'm like, oh my gosh. I wish we could be a little bit more like them. Number two um, is that they, it's only orthodox. So I know things have maybe changed over the years, but it's pretty simple. You go to belong to an orthodox shul, and that's it. And you know what? You break the rules. Don't change the rules. You break them. That's it. <laughs> no reason to change the rules, right? In baseball, you run to first base and then you run to second base. You can't run to second base first. You gotta run to first base. So you might strike out a lot. Sometimes you don't show up to the ball game. Uh, but the rules are the rules. And I found like life would be so simple if there was just, this is the rules. And I'm, I'm to start to use a baseball metaphor, you're, you're batting 200, you're batting 300, you're going to the same ballpark. By us, us Ashkenazim, so there's Orthodox, there's Conservodox, there's Conservative, there's Reformative, there's Reform, there's Renewal. Have you ever heard of that one? There's a fourth branch called Renewal, and uh, then it's, just, it's like, no, no, no. Let's just go back to the way it always was. There's, there's, uh, there's one religion, and you do your best, and that's it. You drive, you don't drive, the rabbi looks the other way, he doesn't look the other way. You know what? It's just one religion. So I find that number two, I know that maybe things are, I just, it's like such a bracha, the Sephardic community. It's just, that's it. There's one rule book and everyone knows it. And uh, I was thinking about it. And the last, the last thing that I wish um, that, uh, uh, which is probably the most important, um, yes, they dive in every word. Um, yes, there's only one rule book. Um, but the, probably the most important thing that I'm jealous of is kavad harabanim, respect for the rabbis. Uh, you walk into an Ashkenazic community, uh, the rabbi walks in, as soon as he walks in, everyone says, uh, my rabbi knows nothing, you know, gets everything off Google. Uh, I wish I would live north, I can go to another shul, right? This rabbi, that rabbi, right? He's not as smart as his brother, who's a rabbi in New York. You go to a Sephardic community, the rabbi walks in, you remember, remember how Elvis used to walk into concerts with his big robe and everyone just be like, ah. <laughs> the respect that the Sephardic community has for now, I know it's self-serving because I'm a rabbi, um, but there's an attitude that people are worthy, of, people are fallible. That's the problem with the church. The church leaders were infallible. And then when the earth wasn't flat, how did they figure that out? Um, and the, the it's, Jews are cursed, they'll never go back to their homeland. And then we went back to our homeland. So when you're stuck on dogma, you, you, you run up a, a creek, right? Uh, but, uh, but so yeah, people are fallible. But the way you treat a rabbi, rabbis are infallible. People that become rabbis are, are fallible. But the respect that the Sephardic community has for their rabbis, it, it shows a, a great respect. And that's something that the Ashkenazi community, I think, can learn from a lot. So uh, anyway, these are just my thoughts about things that I'm jealous uh, or something I look up to in the Sephardic community. All right, wow. Okay, that's great. Um, you have nothing to look yeah, up in our is, yeah, No, I do, I do. I do have something here. I do. That was great. I've got to dig deep to find something yeah, nice yeah, about yeah, the yeah, Ashkenazi no, no. community now. No, I got, something, deep, I got something here in writing. You okay, got something yeah. here in writing. <laughs> um, 
All right, that was great. So I just want to comment on a few things. So polygamy, Sephardic, how does that how does that work? Right. So Rabbi Gershom made the takana. Um, just going back there for a moment. So there's no takana in the Sephardic. Uh, actually, the Shulchan Aruch writes you shouldn't have more than Shulchan Aruch. You shouldn't have more than four wives. So like it was there, but all, already around that time, um, they did institute that you know. It's, it shouldn't be not to the level of Rabbeinu Gershom. It's like if a person, as Ashkenazi, if he takes a second wife, it's like an Avera. Like it, it's like for Sephardim, they made it very strong. We're actually, we're talking about Ketubah's differences. In our Ketubah today, it's written that you're signing that you're not going to marry another wife while you're married. So it's in there, that, that Ketubah. So... For the most part, Sfaradim, but there were still some. I think even in Morocco, I know in Yemen they had, um, could be even Israel, like, you know, the, it's, it's not allowed polygamy in Israel, but could be there's some old Yemenite people that, that people, have yeah. that, you know, but for the most part, it's, it's, uh, it's non-existent. One of the, one of the, uh, I won't get into it. I had a, a, a lady that once tried convincing me that, whatever, it's a crazy story. <laughs> Us rabbis get some crazy stories sometimes. Yeah, polygamous, uh, Crazy story. Um, okay, so um, a little bit about the rabbis, the, the Rambam, of course, you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. Rabbi Yosef Karo, uh, most recently, Rabbi Ovadi Yosef, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> most recently, Rabbi Ovadi Yosef, uh, just, um, just unbelievable, so many ways. Um, so Rabbi Ali spoke about things, three things. Uh, I, I, I set this up kind of like, why I love to be Sephardic, why I'm, I'm proud to be Sephardic. Um, and we'll talk about Ashkenazim as well. But my, so number one is, I just feel like great feelings, especially in, when learning Torah, the Rambam, um, or I named my little son Moshe after the Rambam and my, my great grandfather, but I had that Kavana. And Rabbi Yosef Karo, most recently Rabbi Ovadi Yosef, who after as Faradim were displaced, as Ashkenazim were, of course. When we came to Israel, I'll touch upon this a little bit, you know, there is this back of the mind, you know, I don't want to get into, like, what's out there in the world, the word racism, but there is there's differences. As Faradim were thrown, like, all my cousins that live in Israel, either way up in the north or way up in the south. In, like, the Tel Aviv, like, the hub, the Israel, there's, there's the Sephardim weren't there. So, Rabbi Ovadi Yosef, his great knowledge and, and his great power, and he was like a super leader in Torah. No one could, you know, they made the 10 year limit for chief rabbi because they saw he, was, he they thought he was too much of a threat. Until that point, they were chief rabbis until they passed away. So he lifted up the Sephardic morale. And Baruch Hashem, we're sitting here, and this is so beautiful. And, and I only have an amazing feeling for Ashkenazim. My personal rabbi, uh, Rabbi Meirfeld, Rabbi Asayag, Shalita, should live long and be well. He married my parents, the, the rabbi from here, and, and he's, he was my, my rabbi, basically in halachic guiding light, but my personal rabbis, uh, Rabbi Meirfeld, Shlita, the Rosh Hashiv of Nair Israel here, Rabbi Nolman, one of the rabbis here in Nair Israel. My basically Torah knowledge, except for a few years in a Sephardic yeshiva, was mainly Ashkenazic, and I'm so indebted, and I'm so grateful, and I only had amazing experiences. But there was the, the one area that we hope this type of conversation uh, could spread to is, is is in the Holy Land where you have like a 50-50 Sephardic Ashkenazic and you know there's there's still a little bit of those of those remnants um, and uh, a little story where the only time I kind of felt that was when my little son my oldest Yosef I was living in Israel for six years so one so he was now starting school he was in school there for one year then we moved back here and in that year all the young Americans we sent to the same school. It was an Israeli school, but all your friends sent there. So I want to send there as well. But I'm Sephardic. I'm like, okay, so what? Like, Sephardic. So when I got there, like an older rabbi, and it was, it was, it was really hard. He says, look, I want to let you know we have a quota for Sephar- Sephardim in our school. So I, I understood after where, you know, if you're going to take all Sephardim, it's going to be a Sephardic school. And there's differences, etc. No problem. But he told me, he says, look, let me tell you, Frank, to be Sephardic and you want to come to the school, you either have to have money or you have to have pull. So that was really that was really distasteful. I was like, 
no, this is, is you know. Um, I still did go to that school because that was a school everyone was going to. That's where all the friends were going to, the carpool and all that stuff. So that was a little bit distasteful. Besides for that, it's been, it, it, uh, you know, smooth sailing and an amazing, amazing feeling. I, I know that in Israel there is still this uh, this battle. I think even like in the, like there's never been a Sephardic prime minister and there's, there's, there's a little remnants of that. Um, you know, the world's not perfect, but, uh, you know, each and every one of us could try to, to perfect that. But what I love about being a Sephardic is I feel like we're the underdog in a way. Like predominant, I, I don't know what the percentage, but maybe it's 70% of the world is Ashkenazi Jews, uh, the Jewish world, and 30% Sephardim. So I feel like we're brothers. And anytime you meet a Sephardic, oh, you're Sephardi? Like, I think we all feel that. Are you Moroccan? Are you Persian? Are you, oh, you're Moroccan? Like you feel that brotherly or something you know from the last name. Oh, your last name is Azulai or Azarwal or oh, wow. That, like, and you know the Moroccan last names and you feel an instant connection. I know when I was in Nair Israel, I was, I was an older, uh, <clears throat> I, was, I was older than I would look out for the Sephardic. I would always ask the rabbis, how's this Sephardic boy doing? How's that Sephardic boy? I mean, I love everyone, but I had that like feeling and you have this and I go back now and I, and recently, my mayor, my rabbi put me in my place. I was asking, and he says, you know, we're all the same. Don't ask just about the Sparta boys. Ask about everybody, you know? So he's, he's amazing at, at, uh, at that. So um, I feel like like a little brotherhood among, among Sfaradim. Um, just the, the, the love and emotions and, and showering with, you know, uh, I'll say this story, not from a knock on Ashkenazi, but this is something that I experienced. And, and, and after this, I was like, like I'm so like I grew up in a very warm and loving home, and I once went to summer camp going into 12th grade. Summer camp was in Israel, and it was based out of New York. So I flew to New York with my brother, and then we stayed one night at my friend's house, and we all flew to camp in Israel. We were away for six weeks, and then we came back to New York for that one night, and then and then we flew to Toronto. When we landed in New York, Ashkenazi father sees his Ashkenazi son after six weeks, and he gave him a handshake. <laughs> and then took his thing. I said, I was like, I, my mother would have jumped me and hugged me and kissed me a million times. I miss you, cry and this and that. I said a handshake. I was like, like Baruch Hashem, I'm smart. Like, like, like nothing to know, but something I guess maybe we could learn from. So that is, um, but Ashkenazim, you know. So our emotions as Faradim, I think sometimes, maybe often, get in the way, and sometimes we could be, uh, you know. It's it's as the mission of Pirkevot says, love like blinds. Sometimes you love something. I'm only doing because I love this person, or, and it, it might skew my my vision where I'm supposed to act, you know, be straight and and judge. <clears throat> Sometimes our emotions get the better of us. We'll make quick decisions for the good, quick decisions for the bad, or you know, screaming and this and that, and that could be good or, or negative. I feel I think to learn from the Ashkenazim. I think Ashkenazim, get, they get the job done. If it's, let's say, to build a building or if it's to do something, they just, they get it done somehow. And like, we like, you know, twirling and, and fighting and this and that before we get things done. Uh, sorry, guys. As, you know, as, but like, they, they just get things done. And I, th- I think also, like, they're the less emotional, which wouldn't stray them. So like, you guys in yeshiva, that were like, they were like robots. Like, how is this guy like waking up? Like, when he's, they're locked in, they're like, boom, we're like, dafiomi. And these guys just, and, and like, I should, like, as far as you like, emotional, like, I don't want to wake up today. I don't want, like, this guy said something, so I'm going to, like, not show up today this year. And I should see there, like, day in, day out, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and that's something, like, I envy. And, like, uh, I mean, you guys could agree, like, uh, our president of our shul, uh, Jack Shaheen, is a great guy. He's Iraqi. Our shul's predominantly Moroccan shul. And he's 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 a he's a doctor he's a he's a surgeon, and 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 I love him. He's such a level-headed Ashkenazi Sephardi, right? So in, in my you know so it's so easy to deal with. Or sometimes you get all these emotions, and I like and and like so that's one thing I think we got to learn. Um, don't let emotions get in the way. Uh, also, you know, since so the Rishonim, as I mentioned, the Rambam, the Rif, the Rosh, all the way to the Shulchan Aruch to the 1500s. The Sfaradim has held the torch in Torah. After that, the torch did pass on to the Ashkenazim, the Achronim, Rabbi Akiva Eger, etc. That the main Torah, of course, there was Torah in the Sephardic lands, but the main Torah that's learned in the Yeshivot, etc., from post 1500 is Ashkenazic Jewry. 
And um, until today, it's probably still in the Ashkenazi camp, the Ashkenazi yeshiva, the Ashkenazi garb over, over the Sephardim. Sephardim have made great strides. We have great yeshivot still. We have great yeshivot, but the Ashkenazim still take the torch. And that's something we definitely need to learn is, is the greatness in Torah and, and the, just the accomplishments in Torah. And that's something that's unbelievable that we, that we got to learn. We'll do a Q&A. Huh? We'll do a Q&A. All right. All right, so uh, we're the, it's over. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, one or two questions. Uh, we want to keep everything uh, 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 time, but excellent. This is the first time two rabbis got together, and I think we finished on time. So uh, let's ish, give it up ish. for us. Let's give it up for us. Okay, uh, so just a Q&A, and then, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Music. Dry, spicy. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I'm Sad, happy. <laughs> there's, there's definitely uh, music. Pl- obviously, plays a big role in uh, in, in tefillah and davening. I find that um, yeah. I mean, I think everything is connected to the culture you're in. So we have a very much. Uh, uh, Christian Europe uh, type of vibe in shul. Uh, when I listen to uh, Sephardic uh, music, I feel like it's it's also just sounds sounds very different than than I'm what you, than I'm used to. But I think that in the modern Jewish music, um, you have uh, people that are everyone's listening to. Like uh, I don't know if you heard of Yaakov Shweki, who's uh, Moroccan. I mean, everyone's listening to Shweki nowadays. Whereas I imagine 20 years ago, everyone listened to Mordechai ben David. So I feel like uh, now uh, there's such great cross pollinate cross pollinization that uh, that you know that's it's very very similar um, and so uh, yeah I do find sometimes when I'm in a Sephardic shul and they're singing I'm like this sounds really different I'm not used to it get me out of here um, and I'm sure that the same feeling is when 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 the cantor is just going ay 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 for no reason. I'm like, did he just bang his toe? Uh, so well, that's sort of the Svartic, uh, how Svartan probably view Ashkenazic cantors. But um, Ono music plays a big role, and a lot of it is this, uh, connected to uh, where we came from, you know, Svartic uh, from Muslim lands and et cetera. Okay, Rabbi Mordechai, we have time for uh, one more, one, two more questions. Okay. Tova. Hey, um, I was raised in Morocco, town of Meknes. And um, something puzzles me with the sea wall. Oh, so well. Okay. <laughs> Political. In plastic with sea wall, or you cannot have it. Now, being raised in Morocco, in a very, very religious town, where everybody with Morocco, mm-hmm. if it's chickpeas, any dry ingredients, chickpeas, flour, oil, even uh, um, Tova, so your question so is why is why, why are the changing? Ashkenazic standards of kashrut impacted? Okay. Ingredients and make our lives more <laughs> so is, is that is, a is Ashkenazic a, Svartic question? In a few weeks, in a few weeks, the CUR is going to come up with their booklet, their pamphlet. They used to come out every year. They actually asked me to write an article this year, and I wrote an article on kashrut in the motherland. Dot 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 Morocco. So you'll learn about how kashrut was in Morocco, and I hope you enjoy the article. But in short, back in the day, it was a lot of natural ingredients. Nowadays, with technology and, and all these different chemicals and stuff that's going in, so we gotta have we gotta have people on the ground to make sure that everything is 100% kosher. Back in the day, of course, and and you could eat at your friend's house because they're buying the same natural food from you know from the, sure. the local the local uh, grocer or whatever. Yeah. So it was a lot more natural, a lot more organic, as opposed to now with a lot of other ingredients and stuff mixed in. Okay, all right. All right, we're done. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone.